Thanks for tuning in to High Green, the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society's official podcast. High Green is funded by your membership in the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society, and any opinions expressed throughout the show are solely those of the owner. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and as always, if you're interested in learning more about our organization, you can visit our website, www.bmrrhs.org. Perhaps this story hasn't been told in b and circles, but no. it's, it's a b and story, and it's a good one. And the next thing you know, we hear 119 getting out of town with his steam engine working like the hell. He's going up by way of Rutland. We'd like to thank you for your support this past year. It was a tough one, but certainly we were able to get a lot of new content out to our followers and members, and that's something that really helped us get along throughout the year. If you'd like to make your mark and support the Society and join the Society in our efforts, you can head on over to our website, BMRRHS, and if you're not a member, sign up to become one. Your membership dues go directly to fund the Society and our efforts, and you'll also receive our famous glossy magazine, the B&M Bulletin, several times a year and our newsletter, published bi-monthly. It's a really great way to show your love for the Boston and Maine and New England railroading. And as a member, you can join one of our committees and get right into it. You can find all the info you'll need right on our website. Welcome to High Green, I'm Rick Cafori. Today's feature segment is a little longer than usual, but nevertheless, I think you're really going to enjoy this one as much as I did. We have for you today an interview conducted back in 1988 with retired Boston and Maine Railroad conductor Major Greeno. Major worked primarily on the eastern route of the Boston and Maine around Salem, Massachusetts, and also worked on the branch lines in the North Shore. Major provides a colorful look at the Boston and Maine from the time he hired out in 1941 up until the late 1970s and the early 1980s when he retired. The interview was conducted on March 14, 1988, by Society member Richard Sims and recorded by Robert Hagopian on cassette tape. Without further ado, here is Major telling his stories about the Boston and Maine. Good evening. It's March 14, 1988, and we're at the home of Major Greeno. Okay. In Danvers, Massachusetts, uh, Major was with the railroad for many years as a conductor, and we're going to do a, a little impromptu interview tonight and uh, find out what it was like to work on the railroad during these uh, golden years from the 1940s up until uh, the 1980 period. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, perhaps, Major, we can uh, get into a little introduction. All right. Um, you had a background, I guess your, your family was into railroading even before you were born, is that correct? Yes, my grandfather was a conductor on the railroad for many years, lived over in Marblehead. And then my father was on for 45 odd years, and then I was on for 43 years myself. And my father's brother, he also was on the B&M out of uh, Marblehead. So that's from the time I can remember to think all I ever knew was to go railroading. There mm -hmm. was not, nothing else that was coming along. Mm -hmm. Uh, when were you born? In, uh, I was born on March 26, 1923, in Salem. Mm -hmm. And I lived on the uh, corner of uh, Hawthorne and uh, Endicott Street. And as in those days, all your railroad families lived near the station. And so my father was a brakeman on the railroad at the time. And in the immediate neighborhood, there was Jimmy Millard that was a conductor on the railroad. And there was George Arrington that was a freight uh, brakeman. And there was Muzzy LeGrove that lived up on Mount Vernon Street, where my wife came from. He was an engineer. And, well, there were just so many, I can't remember them all. Sure. But they all were clustered around the railroad because, of course, at that time, none of us had cars. So mm -hmm. it was you, you walked to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather, his house was right at the end of the tracks at Marblehead on mm -hmm. Spring Street. And uh, from the time I can remember... Uh, he would come in there if I happened to be over there and step off the train and walk through a little wooden gate in his yard and stop and feed the chickens and come in the back door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all there was to it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> when you were younger, did your father uh, take you on a train much? Uh, oh, it? yes. Oh, yes. From, from the time I, I can remember, I mean, when I went to work, there really wasn't much that I knew. I had ridden with my father in baggage cars and <clears throat> I had 
knew how to write up mail and uh, the uh, handle milk jugs and, and, and well, I just knew about everything there was. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know one time when I had got old enough to be responsible by myself on a Saturday morning, I would walk down to Salem Depot, and my father was on train number 207. They came into Salem at 8 o'clock in the morning and went to Portsmouth, and he had the baggage car. And I'd have a little lunch with me, and, oh, I, I thought it was great because you'd leave one station, and, for instance, you'd leave Salem, or then between there and Beville, you'd get all the mail and whatever, et cetera, you know, near the door. And, oh, I, I used to work my head off. Mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I knew, you know, just about everything there was about mm -hmm. railroading before I went to, before went to work. Started. That's right, I that's see. right. And uh, jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but... <laughs> It really put my foot into it one time because I hadn't been working too long and I was on the Salem milk job and we were over to Lynn and we were picking up some coaches and the conductor was standing over my shoulder and, and uh, he told me to turn the air ankle clock in easy, which you would do to prevent the brakes from going into emergency. Mm -hmm. And I made the all-time blunder of my life of saying, yes, I know how to do it. And then uh, the boom fell. Oh, mm -hmm. here I was, another... Another goddamn kid of a of a railroad man, and I knew more than he did, and oh, I'm tell so from that day on, I knew enough. Never again did I ever say yes. I know how to do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. What was the uh, the year that you actually started on the railroad? 1941. 41. Yeah, I was graduating from high school. I was 17 years old in 1940. So then, when I turned 18, the following March of 41, I started right in through the interview process. And at that time, uh, after I had made out an application, I was given a letter to take down to Salem Depot to John F. Sweeney, who was the train master on the Eastern Route. And I have the letter in the house here somewhere, I can't find it right now, that asking him to look me over and see if I was the right caliber and uh, did I have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And so I went down and I was interviewed and there again I knew who he was, I had met him, so there really wasn't too much he could tell me, but... One thing they did stress in those days, that the railroad was one occupation that they demanded that you work seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Now, it was against the state law to have you work seven straight days. But, I mean, we all, as a matter of fact, waived that condition, and we did work seven days. Mm -hmm. But they didn't make sure that you knew that if you didn't want to work the seventh day, that they couldn't force you to. I see. So then after that, I went to Dr. Curtis in Salem for my physical. And went into our station to the rules examiner where Ernest Woodman and Herbie Wells were the examiners and they gave me the hearing tests and eye tests and color tests and like that. So then my next uh, uh, procedure was in June. I was called to break in on the Salem Ainsbury local and to report at uh, quarter of seven on the Monday morning down at Salem station where the rest of the crew reported. And this involved riding this freight for a week and usually at the end of the week you would be qualified and the conductor would send a letter to the superintendent stating so. Then the next thing was a three-day breaking period and passion service mm -hmm. and then you were qualified to go to work and I waited until July 16th and that was my first day. I was called to protect a Rockingham race train and what this was, the race trains were made up basically of six cars, but they would have as many as 10 or 12 cars in the train. So for each additional two cars that were put in use, it required another brakeman. Mm -hmm. So they would have to have another brake, enough brakeman standing by. So it was, in my case, they didn't take enough cars, so I wasn't used. But I was called that night, and I went to work on a night Rockport train for the, for the first full-time pay. And by the way, for protecting the race train, that was a three-hour pay. I see. When you started out uh, working, you had obviously a lot of old timers that were still on the road then. Oh yes. Oh, uh, yes. How did they treat new people as they came on? Did they treat them with you know, don't bother me, or did they go out of their way to help you, or just? To... Well, it was black and white. I mean, some of the fellows <clears throat> were so good to you, and but then there were others that all they could see was well, the only reason they were hiring us fellows was to get rid of them, oh, really? and yet really it was foolish because I mean they. Nobody retired. I mean, they, they just worked until they died. And, mm -hmm. I mean, here I was 18 years old and uh, working with Charlie Knowlton up here in Danvers at the time. He was well into his 80s. Uh, I worked with uh, Harmon Drew out to Lawrence, and he was either 90 or 91. Now, these are conductors, 
And here I was, an 18-year-old mm -hmm. kid, and I mean, some of them really held it against us. How could you relate to somebody like that that was that old? I mean, they must have been so set in their ways that no matter what you did, it had to be wrong. That's right. That's true. It was hard. I mean, you'd, uh, I hate to use this term, but things were different those days. I really wanted the job, and I liked the job, and we'd bend over backwards. But it, it was frustrating. I mean, you'd be on a job with a conductor, and you'd say, well, now I know this guy likes the transoms in the doors at each end of the car open for the air. So then you'd open them, and I'll be a son of a gun. He'd come along and say, what do you got that open for? I want it closed. So you would know that he was just antagonistic because mm -hmm. you knew for a fact that that was the way he liked them. Mm -hmm. And I used to work with one conductor over in the Marblehead, George Williams, that lived here in Danvers. And he was quite a, quite a character there. He used to stand at the end of the car, and he'd throw his punch up in the air and catch it behind his back and, and all, all kinds of stunts. But he used to love to stand at the ends of the car and, hey, brakeman, come down here and do this. I mean, he liked to assert his authority, mm -hmm. and you just have to ride with it. That's all. There's right. nothing you could do about it. But uh, some of the engineers, now I work with uh, an engineer. Uh, well, Ed Harvey was one of the ones. Um, he was on what we called the oil job, freight job, that ran at night out of Boston, came up here to Danvers and Tossville. And that guy was a prince. I mean, if he knew that you were a new brakeman or a green brakeman, he wouldn't let you get on or off the train while it was moving. Mm -hmm. I mean, he'd insist. He'd say, now, don't you get off of this car or don't you get on the engine until I stop. I so that was the, the difference. Right. You know. <clears throat> Wasn't it true that also, uh, as these people got older, obviously, you get into your 80s, you start to lose your faculties, you start certainly to lose your physical abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't it actually dangerous to have some of these people uh, still trying to perform as if they were in their 40s and 50s when they got to be 80 and 90 years old? Well, that's something I never thought of, but no, I, I can't say so. I, I can't uh, remember anyone that uh, didn't uh, perform their uh, their duties and uh, seemed to be active for their age because mm -hmm. they've been working all their life. And, and uh, no, I, I, really, uh, I really can't think of that. Some of them, uh, as I've said before, meant their mental... Uh, Faculties weren't impairing, but I mean, it's just that they had it against us young fellows. Sure. And, and I know I was working out of Salem, oh, this would have been in the late 40s, and what had been the old Essex job, but at that time we were putting up at Salem, and then deadheading equipment to Hamilton and Wenham and started from there rather than Essex. So the conductor on there, Morris Whalen, he was in his 80s, and the brakeman, John Welch, incidentally the father of Jack Welch, uh, chairman of the board of General Electric. Mm -hmm. That was his father. It was the brakeman, and he was probably in his 60s at the time. And Morris Whalen was, had his little funny things. He liked to show off in front of people that he was the boss and tell the brakeman what to do. And so he always had this habit when we were down to Hamilton there. He always smoked a pipe, and he'd go off, and, and he'd climb in underneath the, the baggage, the combine, and open the air reservoir valve to clean his pipe out. So he did this one morning, and when he did it, the handle come off in his hand. Well, John and I could hear the air rushing, so we got out of that car just as fast as we could, and we went up in the front car, and John went in one toilet, and I went in the other toilet, and we could hear Morris hollering. So, of course, by the time, time we get out there, he was able to get it fixed, but we didn't say anything, and he didn't say anything, but it was just so funny to hear him screaming because he couldn't, you know, shut the air off. Sure. But uh, he, he learned this lesson, I think, because he treated me altogether different after that, and he was different to John. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to have another fellow, Walter Glover, that lived in Lynn, and he worked 107, 168 baggage car, which was the uh, 8.30 in the morning, Boston to Portland. That was a local all the way to Portland, and then coming back in the afternoon, it was local all the way. <clears throat> and he was the baggage master. Well, on a Saturday... Johnny Walsh and I had to deadhead into Boston and load the baggage car for him. And then we deadheaded to Havel and brought in a passion train. Well, we never could do anything to suit Walter Glover right. If we stood the suitcases up on end so you could write down the tags, he'd say, well, why didn't you stack them? So if we had milk cans, he'd say, well, now, why didn't you put the milk cans in the door instead of the suitcases? So finally, this one sat, he deadheaded in. Johnny, he was a little mischievous and... He says, today, Major, he says, we're not going to do a damn thing to wall that gets there. So we didn't. We sat there, and he came down. And his, all the trucks lined up with mail, newspapers, baggage, steamer trunks, milk cans, you name it. And he come in the car. And, What's going on here? And John says, well, Major and I decided we're not going to put a thing in until you tell us where you want it. 
Well, needless to say, that was the last time that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had our ways of, you know, getting even, sure. so to oh, speak. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You've mentioned here in some of your notes that you gave us this evening, uh, some of the trains mm -hmm. you've worked on. You mm -hmm. mentioned the Ainsbury Local, mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned especially that it took a fair amount of work to get that job over the road, and that today it would take you two days to do it. Could you sort right. of describe, for instance, what that job entailed? Well, you would uh, uh, pick up the train in Salem Yard, and uh, you would go out to the other side of Northy Point to what we call the lead track, where we picked up, you'll hear me use the term quite frequently, high cars. Mm -hmm. These were the cars that wouldn't fit through Salem Tunnel, mm -hmm. that which had to be brought to Salem via Wakefield Junction through Peabody that way to, to Salem. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, integrate those into our train, and, and there again, they wouldn't go all in one place because we'd put the new reports, and so we'd make several switches to get our train in, in order. So then we go along, our first stop would be North Beverly, and if we had more than 14 cars, we had to stop short of the Enon Street crossing, Dodge Street crossing, mm -hmm. because that's all it would hold. And we stopped there every day because there was a siding as you head north on the right-hand side and also a little freight house, but it didn't have an entrance off the track. And this is where we had hay, Canadian hay, for the H.P. Hood uh, farm up on Cherry Hill, all, all their glass milk bottles came in there. So we stopped there just about every day and made mm -hmm. a switch. And then also we would have to break the seal on the Ipswich LCL, or house car as we called it, and unload any North Beverly LCL freight there was, or freight to go in. This is what we did on, on mm -hmm. the job. Mm -hmm. So then we go to Hamilton and do some, at Hamilton, we once in a while would leave a freight car there and make a side trip to Essex. Mm -hmm. So we would leave the train there and go down to Essex the times I went down there, the only thing we went down for, at Essex Falls, there was a short stub track, and they had a platform, and they would put gondola, one gondola at a time, and they loaded the white beach sand. Now, I don't know whether it came from Cranes Beach or what, and that is what they used at the foundry <clears> at the GE and Everett. That's where that white sand came from mm -hmm. off the Essex branch. Yeah, that's and nice. then there was a, a coal yard down in Essex also. So then we come back and get our train and go to Ipswich, and we'd be in Ipswich at least an hour switching. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of work in Ipswich. Then we go to Rowley and stop there and handle LCL freight. Then on to Newburyport, and we'd be in Newburyport anywhere from two hours. Some days we'd be there as much as six hours. Tremendous amount of work in, in Newburyport. In fact, we were paid what we called a yard rate because we did so much work there, what was considered a yard, that it was a, a high-paying job. You got much more. It would be like we were a switcher. I see. And uh, so we'd switch out cars there, and first we'd go up to the freight house, which is where the new fire station is, the new report. That was the freight yard right there with three, three delivery tracks and a freight house. Then we'd come back and do some more switching and go down to the wharf. And about once a week, we'd have three cars of oil for the power plant. Then we'd have uh, uh, Armour or Swift meat cars. And in order to set those, there was a very sharp curve, and we had a stretcher of six old, old dump cars. They never would allow them in service today. And we would have to use those because the engine couldn't go in on the track. The track was so sharp. I see. So we had to use those stretchers to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. set the car. And a lot of other work. Cashman uh, Brothers Coal Yard there, and uh, there was a night's feed place. So then we go back to the junction, then we get on to Newburyport Station, and that's where we'd have our dinner mm -hmm. and take water there at Newburyport. Then go on to Salisbury, and cut off the, at that time now, it would be the uh, Salisbury house car and back in there and do LCL loading. Then go to uh, Amesbury. Sometimes we'd have a car for Salisbury Point. But then on, as soon as we got to Amesbury, we would turn the engine. There was a hand turntable there. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, as we went in there, the great big uh, wood heel fact, New England wood heel plant there, there was a trailing point switch, which means it comes out onto the track. And that's where they loaded sawdust cars. And about every three days, they'd have a box car. So we would stop, and it was on a steep incline. And we would open the switch and let go of the handbrake. And two or three of us just lean against the car, and the car would slide right out and go right down the main line ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So that was the easiest way to go in there to get the sawdust car out. So then we turned the engine on the turntable. Everybody but the conductor helped. I mean, the engineer, the fireman. The head man, the flagman, and also what we call the middle man, the third brakeman. We all helped turn the engine. And we did a lot of switching there. Then we would come back, and 
pretty much run high ball right to uh, Northy Point and drop a uh, high cars and put them in the Salem yard. But oh, I, I, I made a bad mistake here. I don't have to regret. This is later on. At that time, I'm talking 1941. You come back to Newburyport, and you got train orders at Newburyport Tower. There was a tower there, and we went on to the Newburyport branch, stopped at Byfield, and loaded the little cartons. I guess they weighed about seven or eight pounds. A Byfield snuff, red top snuff. Oh. And we had to load all those into the, to the, uh, way car. Then we leave our train at Georgetown, which is, well, where, I don't know the name of it now, but it was Curry's ice cream stand was mm -hmm. right there. And whatever cars we had, we'd back up to Groveland. And at Groveland, we used to take oil or coal. Uh, once in a while, somebody up there used to get a carload of potatoes. Then we'd come back and get our train and then run down to Topsfield to Danvers down to North Street, Salem, drop our cars in North Street Yard, yeah, the high cars, and then put up in Salem Yard. Yeah. And how many hours would something like that consume? The norm, normal day, almost always they have done just about 6 o'clock mm -hmm. at, at night. And you started at what time in the morning? At quarter or 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And handled, uh, it's funny, I mean, uh, even though uh, your customers had different, it always seemed you'd have about, seemed every morning you'd have, well, between 12 and 15 cars out of Salem and and by the time you come back at night, it seemed like you'd have 12 or 15 empties. Mm -hmm. Well, it just, just so happened, you know. And, uh, and uh, at that time, they used to load a railway express car in Newburyport Station on the sidetrack there. And if they had an express car at night or in the morning, it was brought down on the ports of local freight to Salem. And that would be next to our caboose. So when we were down to Newburyport, when we got left ready to leave Newburyport Junction after doing our work at the wharf, we would put the express car on the head end mm -hmm. and push that with the engine into Newburyport Station and cut off the engine and go down over the spring switch and back and then shove the express car into the station. And then at night, train 246 out of uh, Portsmouth would pick up that car, which would be loaded basically with hats from Newburyport, mm -hmm. from the big hat factory in Newburyport, almost mm -hmm. filled that car. But if that car had been late, some days they would bring that car down on train 217, which was a 1230 out of Boston, and they would drop it at New Report on the main line, and then we would be right there with our engine to, to set it. Mm -hmm. So some days we might have all our work done, but we might have to just sit there for two hours and wait for that train so that we could make that uh, switch. Mm -hmm. and while you're doing all this, you had to work around, of course, regular passenger trains. Which, oh, yeah. In those days, it was far more than the right <clears> thing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We used to have it pretty well figured out that we'd being on the eastbound siding there at the Ipswich for uh, train 207, and uh, that would be get there about quarter of nine, and we would go in the Agawam Diner and have our breakfast mm -hmm. while we were waiting there. And, and we had it pretty well figured out, you know. Mm -hmm. And because to go in on the Newburyport branch, because that was double track from Newburyport over the drawbridge and like that, and uh, we crossed over hand throw switches at, uh, at uh, Salisbury, and then a switch to go in on the siding. And uh, before we could come back onto the main line back from Ainsbury, we would have to call the dispatcher and get permission to mm -hmm. come out on the main line mm -hmm. because we wouldn't know whether all the first-class trains had gone or not. Let me see. Was there any passenger service at Ainsbury at that time? No, not when I... already no. done away Yeah, with. That, that had been done away with when mm -hmm. I hired out. See, when I hired out, the Ainsbury branch was still active, but then it wasn't too long after I'd gone to work that that was done away. Was there still a roundhouse there, or had that been taken? Yes, yeah, and because it's still there today, mm -hmm. the two-stall engine house. was the town highway garage, but I think the last time I went by there, I don't know, but now it's a it's a private garage. But you look down in behind the library mm -hmm. on Route, uh, what, that's what, Route 22, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, and off to the left, at the end of the baseball field, you can see this two-stall building with high doors, and that was the engine house. And then off to the right of that was the station. Now, before my time, I don't remember... But because years before that, the trains didn't stop there. They used to go along and go in behind where uh, Ship Ahoy and Woodsman, Woodman's Restaurants are and go over there to, oh, I'm sorry, what they call it? I think it was South Essex. You know, well, yeah, possibly. Yeah. And the, the station is still there. Mm -hmm. If you look over there from in behind Woodman's of those restaurants on the causeway, you can see the old station which somebody uses as the house. It's a house, yeah. yeah. but that, when I was a little kid, I can remember the tracks going there, but I never went there by mm -hmm. train. Um jumping off to a little different subject you mentioned here snow trains that's the, mm -hmm. 
the ski trains, ski trains that the right. railroad actually started themselves. That That's true? right, yeah, yeah. Um, they say that those snow trains are actually what developed the, the ski business in New mm -hmm. Hampshire mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it took off during the 1950s after the snow trains quit. That's right. And it's what made it what it is today, really. Mm -hmm. That's it was right. the railroad that started all that. And I know at the time, the reason that it was stopped, that we were told, was that as your modern-day business and automobiles are coming along and like that, they would rather have the people come up there by automobile because they spent more money up there. Is that right? They, they'd buy gasoline and like that, and cause they'd ride up on the train, and they'd have their lunches with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so actually they didn't spend as much money coming in by rail as they did by driving up there. I see. So we always, at the time, we were told that was the reason. And a, a little antidote about... North Conway, well, two stories, really. Uh, after I was married, I took my wife with me on one of the snow trains one Sunday. And uh, when we'd stop at Dover, uh, train master at Dover, the name was Ray Cape, a little tiny short man. Real uh, hard man on rules. I mean, he was after you every minute on the rules. Well, he would get on, on the train there at Dover. <laughs> he looked like a bum, as my wife would explain. He wore, always wore a slouch hat and an old raincoat, and a pair of boots that came way up here, and they were never buckled up. Now, if I had a pair of overshoes that weren't buckled up, I'd have been out of service. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he got on this day, and my wife was sitting down on the train somewhere there, and he'd come along, and, and if you had the transoms and the doors open, he'd shut them. If you uh, had the lights on, he'd shut them off. Everything would be just the opposite as to what we'd have. Mm -hmm. So, because we knew, and I walked right up behind him, and, and uh, we had the, uh, the lights... Uh, on on the cars and by the way these were our steel coaches so these were all battery electric in each car they mm -hmm. weren't head end power mm -hmm. so he went along and he adjusted every transit and, and changed the lights and I'm only one car late behind them putting them right back the way they were you know so when I come back and you know, my wife says who was that one went through I said that's my boss that's the train master well she's she's never lived it down so then coming back at night after they took tickets because everybody was tired so we'd cut the lights way down you know, mm -hmm. so there'd be just a few few bulbs on. And that son of a gun, he'd come through, and he'd turn all the lights on full blast. As soon as he walked through, he'd turn them down again. And if he ever had looked at us when we left Dover, taking a look at the train, he would have noticed as all those cars went by, the, the lights were all out right. again. But uh, the other story, uh, my wife and I were up there, and we had walked up to Cannon Mountain to watch the ski mobile, and we came back, and we decided we'd go in and have an ice cream soda in the drugstore. So, because it was a winter time, and we had our ice cream soda, and oh, I don't remember the price, but it was oh, it was exorbitant, four times the price what it would be around here. Well, when I undid my overcoat, and then because it showed my coat and my vest, oh, you on the railroad? And he says, yes, I'm on the. Oh, well, for you it'll only be, well, we'll say seventy-five cents is against two dollars and seventy-five cents, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we never lived that down. And I don't know today, but it was a known fact in those days, particularly for the ski train people, they jacked the prices up tremendously. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they did a terrible, terrible job on the people. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. But, always, yeah. They always want to ruin yeah. a good thing. But those were a real popular train. We used mm -hmm. to run, about every Sunday we'd run two trains with probably, oh, eight or ten coaches in each train. Mm -hmm. Then they'd have a baggage car in the middle, and the Armstrong Company would be there, and they would sell box lunches, rent skis, and uh, they did a tremendous business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you uh, were running those, that was uh, before the war, after the war? Yeah, I was I was uh, on them. Well, as I say, I got married in 49, and my wife went on two of them with me on, on then. So I would say, see, I was in the service from 43 to 46, and I worked them several times up until 49, roughly, in that period, yeah, mm -hmm. that they were on then. Mm -hmm. So you, you were in the Army from after 1942? 43, uh, from uh, October 43 until Valentine's Day of 46. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, doing the same type of work, railroading all over all over Europe and uh, like that, doing the, the exact same type of work. Mm -hmm. But it was very difficult for us experienced railroad men, which we all were. I mean, in order to be in the bataille and as a conductor and so forth, you had to be an experienced railroad man. Mm -hmm. And the Army r rules were just so much different than ours, as Russ could uh, associate with or anybody works today, <clears throat> that we in no way can stand in the middle of a track to uh, get on to an approaching engine or something like that. But this is the way they did it down south, and this was the Army rules. Mm -hmm. We're taught to stand along the side and approach from the side. 
But their rules, if the engine was coming towards you, I mean, gee, you just stood on the track, and then when the engine came up, you just stepped right into the engine, and if you lost your step, you go underneath. But this was the Army rules, and we had to, had to abide by it, see. Because they had their rule book, the Army rule book, and then we had a cheap, Railroad watch that you know the army provided us, you know, to work with and like that. So uh, it was it was a lot of fun though. I can imagine it was. But it was it was disheartening though. I was getting my sixty nine dollars a month as a PFC, and that's my father would write to me and he mentioned different fellows on the railroad, you know, and so and so. Gee, his check last week was this or that, you know, and how much did you get? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of rub it into me. Yeah. So it uh, it cost me a lot of money to be in the service, sure. you know, getting away, you know, from that. Uh, when you came back after the war, what did the railroad hold jobs open, or you have first uh, we had, preference? Yes, we had we had preference because we'd all been gone so long that uh, jobs had all been bid off by junior men to us and like that. So we had bumping rights. Mm -hmm. And when I went in the service, I owned uh, train number twenty four twenty one, which was a deadhead equipment out of North Street, Salem, to Danvers. And then we went in over the New Report branch to Boston and finished up in Salem at night. So when I come back from the service, that I would have gone back on that. In fact, I did, I think, for a week until I got acclimated. Then I displaced on to the uh, Aintree local place. And uh, so that's what most of us did. And then we had six months to uh, take the conductor's exam because, of course, all of us, our time period had gone by when we would have been asked to qualify. Mm -hmm. So when we did qualify, we went into the position where we belonged, or otherwise anyone that hadn't gone in the Army, uh, we went ahead of them. I, see. I mean, uh, uh, under the GI Bill of Rights, you know, mm -hmm. we were protected our rights, so we went right into a position which kind of hurt some fellows, but at the other hand, I mean, it was only, you know, it was only fair. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some people that had hired out that fought the war, and then when a lot of us fellows started coming back, well, then they quit the railroad, you know, right. went into other, other jobs. Right. <clears throat> you were on freight originally, is that how it worked? No, I, I went on to passenger service originally. Mm -hmm. And once in a while I would get called for freight service in emergencies. If the spare board would be exhausted, they had the right. No, when I was on the freight was when I came back from the war, and I went on to the Ainsbury local for about a year. Then I was bumped off of there, and I went on to the Knight Portsmouth local, and I was a qualified conductor, so I was getting a lot of spare conductors work, too, you see. In fact, it was, they were shorthanded and quite often. We'd come in from Portsmouth at night, and we'd leave there at 7 o'clock at night and get into Boston eh, roughly around 1 a.m. And quite often when we called, uh, excuse me, from Chelsea to find out what tracks we were going to go in into the yard, they'd say, well, to tell me that they had a Portland Extra or a uh, Haverhill Extra waiting for me. And mm -hmm. soon I would jump right off and get right on that and be the conductor on that. They were so hard up for help. Mm -hmm. So that's how I did a lot of... Uh, freight work, you know, in that way. I like freight work because, uh, well, the freight cars can't talk back to you, number one, and there's no, no handling of money, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was just handling way bills and uh, handling money, although I have to tell you one odd story, on the Ainsbury local down to New Report, uh, well, I won't say what, but there was a coal company down there, and they had very bad credit, so the only way, you had to go to their office when you get down there and say, We've got two cars of red anthracite out here. The, the bill is $600. And until they put the check for $600 in the hand, you couldn't put the cars in. in. It was COD. Though. Yeah, that's right. And then when we get up to New Report Station, where the freight, uh, freight house, rather, we would hand the check over to him. And that's the only way. And yet this company, they were so nice to us that every Christmas, the whole time they were in business, that each one on the, on the freight crew always got a fifth, I guess it is, of Caldwell's rum. That was made there in New Report, mm -hmm. and sometime during the day before Christmas, they, one of the cars would drive up and they'd open up the trunk and let's see now there's six fellows on the crew and they'd hand just six quarts of Caldwell's rum, mm -hmm. and yet they were the ones that their credit was absolutely nil. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in those days you you were the conductor of a freight and you were the conductor. Mm -hmm. I mean you had a yeah okay yeah so the uh, conductor would make out a stripper and he would list all the cars. And then he would give it to the middleman, and the middleman, in actuality, going along the road, would run the job. I, I mean, you wouldn't see the conductor. He'd be mm -hmm. in the caboose. Not that I don't mean he wouldn't be busy, but there was a lot of paperwork. Sure. And so he would be busy, and the middleman, in essence, would be the conductor. How, how many cars would be on a train, say, up to uh, 
teams for your Portsmouth or something like that? Well, on the Portsmouth local, we used to start out of Boston. We left there at 3.30 in the morning. And I'd say our average train was about 60 cars. That uh, we'd drive about 20 at Chelsea, mostly empty oil tanks. Mm -hmm. And we didn't touch Lynn unless we had beef to set at Lynn. Then at Salem, we would drop probably 25 cars or so and pick up at Salem cars going east. And then across the other side of the tunnel, we would pick up the high cars and usually go into Portsmouth with oh, 20 odd cars mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was on there during the year 1948, that's when they were rebuilding the, well, at that time, the toll bridge between Seabrook and Hampton. And uh, we carried every bit of construction materials that went into that bridge. They had mm -hmm. a huge uh, gravel pit, you'll call it, in the Hampton Freight Yard. And there was like two or three sizes of stone and all the cement. And we'd have about 20 cars each morning on there. And that was a big, big business. Mm -hmm. And the way the Portsmouth local worked, you had two crews that only worked three nights a week. What I mean is I worked, we started out Monday morning at 3.15. We got to Portsmouth, slept all day in the buggy, and left there at 7 o'clock at night. Tuesday morning, we'd be getting done in Boston, we'll say 1, 2 o'clock. Then we went to work again Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. So there was what we call two crews. Mm -hmm. And we got a day's pay for each trip. So it meant we each got six six days pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the way back at uh, night, usually we'd go in with more cars and we would have uh, we'd have quite a string out of Portsmouth. And then we'd only pick up at Lynn and Chelsea. But at Lynn, we would clean up Lynn. We'd pick up off the track next to the main line, all empty Lynn cars, all loads. Then we'd pick up two or three house cars, and then we'd go inside the gate at the GE and pick up another 10 or 15 cars inside the GE. Mm. And then we'd go to Chelsea and pick up another 20 cars. So then we went into Boston, the way the setup was there. They would let us know at Chelsea, because everything was done by telephone, what tracks we were going in on. And usually we'd go in on track 23 in yard 9, and I can't remember now. It held like 30 cars, so the head end man, you would drop off and cut from 30 cars and haul those cars in and then come back with the engine on a clear track and pick up the rest of the train. By doing that, we got an extra hour's pay. Mm -hmm. That was a penalty payment for doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a pretty heavy train. A lot of the oil that we would get out of Portsmouth or gasoline, because those were all loaded tanks and sometimes we'd have as many as 14 or 16 cars on the caboose. So we'd have, a, have quite a tonnage train. Mm -hmm. And several times when I was on there, uh, they, we were so heavy that we doubled out onto the main line just west of Portsmouth Station. And when Passion Train 250 came in there, they would have to push us up the hill because we couldn't, we couldn't get out of Portsmouth. They would push us to Northampton. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we would be all right from there on in. But, but from the time you left Portsmouth Yard and you stopped to clear the rear end while your line just switches up, you were on quite a hill. Mm -hmm. And from there to up to, well, you've heard the term Breakfast Hill. Breakfast Hill. Yeah, well, and so... More than once, they had to push us. I see. And there again, if they pushed us, they didn't get any extra pay. But if for any reason we had a real heavy train, and they would leave their train in Portsmouth Station and cut off their engine and push us, then they all got an hour's pay for it, uh -huh. the way the work rules were. Mm -hmm. But if they didn't cut their train off, they didn't get anything for it. So that's the way, you know, your different work rules. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> what about the... Uh traffic in and out of the naval shipyard up there. What did that add to the... Uh, that, uh, that didn't handle... Too, well, coming out of Boston, oh, I don't think we averaged two cars a day. But you see, you had another freight that came across from Manchester, New Hampshire, through Rockingham Junction. Mm -hmm. And they got most of that stuff because freight coming from the west and like that, it would be diverted to Manchester mm -hmm. rather than have it come all the way into Boston sure. and then not. So we didn't uh, see too much of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing, mentioning the Portsmouth uh, Naval Shipyard, when I first went on the railroad, there was a pasture train that ran every morning from Manchester, New Hampshire, to the Naval Shipyard with employees. Mm -hmm. And that was a heavy train that had about eight cars. And I know I happened to be working some pasture train down to Portsmouth, one in particular, that we would be made up in the yard waiting for this Naval Shipyard train to to come through, mm -hmm. and even though the uh, branch was partly Portland Division and partly New Hampshire Division, they had an agreement that it was a New Hampshire Division train crew that was on that train. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, 
Nowadays it's different, but hash and freight. Otherwise, you had a lot of trains that would run on two divisions, and we would have equalization of the mileage. Mm -hmm. And so that now, like some of your freight trains that would come out of Fitchburg and go to Portland, uh, maybe for six months it'd be a two-sided job. That is every other day. And for a while, one crew would be Portland Division crew, and the next would be Fitchburg. Well, then there'd be too many miles of crew, so maybe then there'd be entirely Fitchburg crews. I see. And it was the same way on the Pasha trains. Uh, they would equalize the mileage to share mm -hmm. it equally. Mm -hmm. But that Portsmouth Navy the shipyard Pasha train, I mean, that was a, boy, that train used to, there's either six or eight cars, and there wasn't a seat in the train mm -hmm. either. They were completely filled. So all the employees, or a lot of them anyway, came yep. by train. Yeah, yeah, evidently they did. And this is all came out of Manchester, and my, I never worked it, but I don't think they stopped anywhere else either. I think it was express from Manchester right into Portsmouth. That reminds me of another incident like that you might want to elaborate on. The United Shoe and Beverly mm -hmm. they have their own siding, right. and they used to run trains in there with employees. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever get involved with that? No, I never did, but I know all about it. Uh, there was a passenger train came out of Boston in the morning, and a four-car train, and they stopped at all the stops, Chelsea, uh, Everett, rather, Chelsea and Revere and, and Lynn, Swampscott, Salem. And I don't think they stopped at Beverly Depot. And they used to go right down into the shoe there. And they have about four carloads of people. Mm -hmm. Then they would put on their backup hose and back the train into Salem Depot. Excuse me. Then the train would go to Danvers, empty, and that would be a passenger train down to Salem, drop the passions at Salem, go over to Lynn, and put the four car trains off on what we call the wall track near East Lynn and put the engine across in the engine house. And those are the four cars, as I referred to earlier, that later on in the day, the milk job would pick up mm -hmm. and take those cars into Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, then at uh, night, hmm, I don't remember how, this was the moment, I don't remember at night how the uh, train got there, whether they came out deadhead or I, I, I never worked it, and I'm not aware. I, sure. I, really, I really don't know what happened at night. But the engine that was left at the East Lynn Engine House the 1230 Portsmouth train would come out of Boston noontime. They would drop two cars in Lynn Station. And there would be a crew get on there, and Charlie Knowlton happened to be the conductor at the time. And Ralph Hood was one of his brakemen, and I don't remember who the other brakeman was. And they would hook the engine onto those two cars and go to Marblehead. Mm -hmm. Turn on the loop on the wire at Marblehead, come back, and be sitting over on the uh, side track. Then when the 245 Rockport train came out, they dropped two more cars on the main line. Ah, now it comes to me. And they picked up those two cars, and that gave them the four cars. Nice. And then they went over to Marblehead again. Mm -hmm. And then they came back to Boston. They came back to Lynn and went to Boston. But I still can't figure how. I don't remember whether that United Shoe train came out of Boston. It must have came out of Boston, but I don't remember how it did. But see, Marblehead... Of course, there was only a several trains a day that came from Boston, but in the evening, we used to call it, there was the Marblehead ferry boat, practically, and there was a crew that went to work at 4 o'clock and relieved the first morning crew out of Marblehead, and Guy Hoyt was the uh, conductor, and Frank Stevenson, that lived right there in Marblehead on Highland Terrace, was the brakeman, and Jim Punchett from Middleton was the engineer. And they picked that train up, and they went right into Boston, and then they came out to Marblehead. And then between then and 1 a.m., they made three round trips between Marblehead and Lynn. Mm -hmm. And they would connect with the, the outbound trains. See. And that was a horror of a job. Nobody, no, nobody liked the job because well, all the, all the brakeman was doing was cutting the engine off of one end and mm -hmm. putting it on the other end. And one trip you'd go to Marblehead, and you'd wire the whole train, and another trip you would put the train between the switches and why the engine and oh that was a, that was a horror no mm -hmm. and yet those two fellows guy hoyt and frank stevenson thought that was a wonderful job mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the way people do and they didn't finish until about four to past one in the morning mm -hmm. you know they made a connection with the last rockport train at night it sounds to me that, that you know especially a schedule like that would be tough enough to do in good weather i can imagine what it must mm -hmm. have been like in, in the snowy weather in the winter time the ice oh yes you know, that must yeah. have made just terrible. Yeah, yeah. They would have quite a scheme, unless it was terribly cold out. It was a nuisance to hook up and unhook steam hoses. Mm -hmm. In later years, they were metallic couplings with an elbows, but in those days, they were rubber hoses. Mm -hmm. 
and they froze on you. And you get in underneath there and try to pull up that one hose and pull out that other hose and to hook them in. And then you had pins. You had to use a hammer to knock the pins across. It wasn't like an air hose that slips into yeah. place. And uh, they had it worked out pretty good. And they'd know just about how cold it could be that they could go over, we'll say, from Linda Marblehead and get away with maybe that trip not hooking the steam hose up. And the cars would stay. They'd be so careful. They wouldn't leave, let anyone open the doors hardly mm -hmm. to keep keep the, the heat, heat in, in so there. they wouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But because the steam heat, now, like uh, working in Salem, Salem was the only terminal that I know of on the whole Boston Railroad, Rain Railroad that did not have steam heated trains at night, really? which meant every train in Salem, you started with ice cold gas. So on each one of the trains, one of the men would be designated to go to work an hour early in the winter. And the engine would come out of the engine house, and he'd hook up that steam line. And uh, at that time, they had a car inspector, so he did that part. But then you'd have to wait, and sometimes it would take 10 or 15 minutes before that live steam could push all the water out through the rear end of your train. Mm -hmm. Then when you got live steam, then you would close it. Then you had to go in and wait until the valves unfroze so that you could turn the valves on to get heat in the cars. And, I mean, that was a tough job. I mean, boy, it was cold. I mean, and you couldn't get up on the engine because you had to be in the cars trying to, you know, unthaw the valves. Mm -hmm. Lots of times they'd be frozen, and, and you'd have to use a few Z, and because you do that, and then the car would get stunk up with fumes. The passengers would get on and complain, but uh, steam heat was a, quite a problem. And if you were putting a train up at night, uh, we had to break the hoses. That is, like over at North Street, we'd come down the, from, from Tossfield. We had eight cars on that one train uh, from Danvers. And we, the brakemen, had to go through, and we had to unhook. These were metallic couplings then, but you would have to unhook each coupling and let <coughs> drop them down and let the water drip out mm -hmm. and then hook them up again. And here we were in our blue serge suits, you know, like that. And, boy, I'm telling you, that was... That's amazing. That was... Dirty work, yeah, it, it, it really was, yeah. You, you picture that, and, I mean, you hear the problems of today, I mean, with, mm. with everything being electric, and there's still problems with heat. And yeah, that's right. To go back to those yeah. days and, yeah. and try and, and do all of that. That's right. Uh, it's yeah. amazing where we, uh, you know, come and yet not seem to have progressed at all. We had a, what we call the steam heat job over in Marblehead that was the most hated job on the railroad. And you went to work at midnight over in Marblehead, and the way the trains were laid out, there was... Two cars, then a split, then two cars, a split, four cars, then a crossing, and then six cars in the station. And the engine house, you hooked up a hose on the front end of one of there was two engines there. And then you had to couple to, to the cars mm -hmm. all the way right down to the end there. And it meant, well, from the engine, it meant about six times that you had to hook the hoses up and to get the steam through. And then you had a very uncooperative night hostler there that would fall asleep and before you knew what the steam pressure would drop and you'd start freezing up and i mean that was a terrible there wasn't a night went by that you wouldn't blow at least one or two steam hoses at three o'clock in the morning and to hear 110 pounds of steam pressure go pow i mean oh and wake up the whole town mm -hmm. they were rubber hoses so then of course <clears throat> you'd have to blanket right where the brake was and get your claw wrench and put on a new rubber hose and hopefully you could do it before the cars behind the brake would freeze up on you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a fight all night long. And then in the morning, you put on your white shirt and black tie and suit and worked in on train 2204 as a brake. And that was the, the night's job. And, I mean, that was a that was a horror. People simply wouldn't do that today. I mean, no. You just couldn't no. find anyone to no. do that. No, they, 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 they wouldn't because it was, it was just a horror. And, and uh, as I say, the lack of cooperation was, mm -hmm. was unbelievable, mm -hmm. you know. It's, they, uh, this fellow, as I say, had this job, and he'd fall asleep. Uh, if you holler at him, he'd get mad, and then he'd put on too much pressure. And because mm -hmm. you'd blow hoses from, mm -hmm. from too much pressure. You know, and, uh, so that was quite a problem. <clears throat> In wintertime, I know, for instance, I guess it was the winter of 1948 when we had so much snow. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Today, when there's too much snow, they just stop running. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Back then, obviously, that didn't happen. No. Uh, what did they do, basically, to keep the lines open? Run a lot of trains? or yeah, Well, the, the snow plows. I, now, I was on the Portsmouth local, and I remember going uh, down to Portsmouth that morning. Uh, well, first thing, we started out, they canceled us out of Boston, and they had us run a snow plow out of, out of Boston. And, in fact, I was the conductor because 
the conductor on our job, uh, George McPherson, wasn't qualified as a conductor on this Tosfield and Danvers branch. So I had to, you know, I got extra pay for it. And then the section foreman that I had run in the snow plow, he didn't know where the crossings were. He didn't know where to lift the flanger braid. So I worked the snow plow all the way, working the flanger blade because I knew the branch by the back of my hand. You know, I knew every crossing and like mm -hmm. that. So then we plowed to Topsfield and back to Danvers and pulled the plow down to Salem and, and cut it off there. But then the plow had come out of Portsmouth and had done the main line up as far as Salem. Mm -hmm. But I know coming back that night, I've got pictures somewhere in the house here, taken of myself and the rest of the crew. We were in the side track at Seabrook, right in front of the station on the curve, standing with one foot on the roof of the caboose and the other foot on the snow pile. That's how high the snow was between the side track and the main line. And the caboose probably was, I don't know what, 12, 14 feet high. Mm -hmm. I don't know how high mm -hmm. a caboose was. And we were just standing there. And I know when we stopped at New Report Station, well, we went up to the little store there to get something. And the only way you got in the stores there at the Washington Street crossing, they had dug tunnels. Mm -hmm. And that was that real bad snowstorm. That It was much worse down that way in through the Merrimack. But we ran every day, though. Mm -hmm. And the uh, morning of the big, what was it, 78, the blizzard we had, uh, I was working passion service out at Ipswich that morning. And they told me to tie everything together. I was a conductor on the first train out there, and they told me to, tie everything together, so I think I had two, four, five, I think I had about nine bud cars, but we couldn't we couldn't get out of there, so John Cadigan come along on the new report job, and they only had one bud car, but they had run a diesel with them the night before. So they come along and, and hooked on to the front of us, and that's how we got out of Ipswich, and we got stuck in Lynn Station, and Paul Abbott was the engineer, and he got permission, he went down to a hardware store and bought a bunch of shovels, and we shoveled ourselves out of Lynn Station, mm -hmm. the engine, just mm -hmm. cut the engine off, and he run the engine light into Boston to break their roadbed out, you know, and that's how we get into Boston, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the big storm, and of course nothing ran east of Beverly then for days, days, yeah. days and days, you know. Mm -hmm. And I ran shuttle trains the whole time between uh, Boston and Beverly. Mm -hmm. They'd call me, and I'd drive in from here early in the morning, all by myself on Route 1, because, you know, non-essential traffic. That's was, right. Nothing on the highway at all. Route 1, completely deserted and drive-in. And, and they had three shuttle trains, I think, working with four cars on each one with a diesel on each end. And you just got going constantly. I mean, you'd leave Boston, you'd have four cars full of people. As soon as you got the Beverly and unloaded, got another load, you'd go back to Boston. Mm -hmm. And that's all we did continually. And every train was completely filled up. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's the way we kept the business going. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> getting away from snow but staying with the weather. What about mm -hmm. flooding? I know you see pictures in the old employees' magazines of floods and things like that that raised havoc. In the yes, area. yeah. The only the only time I ever was bothered by any high water was one time, I guess it was one of the hurricanes or something, and the passenger yards out in Boston, Yard 2, which was the passenger yard that's opposite the current engine house there, that was completely underwater, that yard was, and I know I went out to back a train and then the only thing I could do is they they would get us we'd stand on the front footboards of the switcher and he'd go up to the rear end of the train and you'd get on to that. Mm -hmm. Well obviously you couldn't put your back up holes on or anything like that. And they'd hook the engine on from the other end and not put any air in the train or anything and just back it out of the, the water and get out down towards the main line and then the car inspector would hook the air up and like that. And that's the only time that I ever was bothered with water. Mm -hmm. One of the hurricanes, I don't know which one it was, I came out of Boston on train 1311, which was the 501 to Danvers by the New Report branch, and we got as far as the uh, Lowell Street crossing as Peabody, and as you go up the hill there, which you can see as you go along the highway there, because uh, it's heavily forested, and there were trees down. So they, uh, we were there about three hours while the section crews were up ahead of us cutting the trees down. Mm -hmm. And I know it was such an eerie sensation for me. I was the flagman. And I knew the other train would be behind us, but I didn't know where they were, so I had to be outdoors aware of it. So I was standing down on the turnpike crossing, Route 1, and because nothing moved and everything so dark, and from the time an automobile, I guess, would about leave the ship resting in, in, in uh, Linfield, I could see the headlight coming, and finally they'd go by me on the highway. Mm -hmm. And it was quite, a, quite an eerie feeling. 
And uh, so we finally we finally got through there anyway, but they had to cut all the uh, the trees out of our mm -hmm. out of our way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, let's take a little break right now, and then we'll have a, maybe a glass of water. Or right. Oh, we'll, sure. We'll get back to this. Right. Fine. Sounds all right. Okay. Yeah. Red lights on yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, we're rolling. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we're back again. Um, just to wind up a couple of things here before we before we get into some new subjects. Um, when you came back from the war, uh, the long distance passenger service was, was in decline at that point. Right. The interstate mm -hmm. highways were, were being built shortly afterwards. What was the longest run that you had when you were in passenger service? Personally, it would be from uh, Boston to Portland. Mm -hmm. Although the snow train, I suppose, would be the longest, but mm -hmm. because that was an express, I mean, right. it wasn't a, a working train. Right. But uh, no, to, uh, to Portland was as, as far as we went from, uh, from Boston. Mm -hmm. That was over the eastern route? Okay. I worked it both ways because the eastern route was done away with not That's too long, long okay. after after I uh, went to work there. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly, well, I had a breaking job in Salem at one time. And I'll say, well, it's after we had the bud car, so it must have been the early 60s. And my Saturday run, conductor Jimmy Millard and myself, we uh, ran train 105, which was a single bud car, propelled bud car. And it's funny, the regular car on that train happened to be the car number 6105. And we went out over the New Hampshire division to Wilmington, the Wildcat, to uh, to Portland, and then we laid in Portland all day long, and then came back in the uh, early evening. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't remember what hurricane it was, but when we had the one bad hurricane, we were down in Portland, and we ran back, and we got back as far as uh, Kennebunk, and there was a eastbound train in the station on the westbound track, and when they came out of there and crossed over, it was a conventional train, and the crossover was just evaporated underneath them, and they didn't go off the track, but it had been undermined. So mm -hmm. we had to take the bud car, and we just barely got back into Portland because all around the Four River Bridge, the fill was washing away. And then later that night, all of us crews were brought by bus, you know, in, into Boston. Mm -hmm. And that was only a single single bud car at that time. That's mm -hmm. how little the amount of business was. Amazing. Yeah, it had real. And then later on, they changed the crews that we would work that just as far as Haverhill, mm -hmm. and then another crew would get on at Haverhill and take it from Haverhill through to uh, Portland, and we would pick up a train at Haverhill Yard and bring that, you know, into Boston. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I first went, started work, of course, you had 101, which left Boston around 2.20, and that had the morning papers and like that, and not many passions. It was more what we'd call a head-end train with mm -hmm. railway express cars and <clears throat> mail cars and like that. And when that got to Portland, that split up and uh, made quite a few of the early morning trains out of Portland to Bangor and like that. Mm -hmm. And then your next train was 107, which was uh, 730 out of Boston for Portland. That was local. And then at 11 o'clock was, I guess it was the Flying Yankee, I guess the name, at uh, 940. That was the Hutshot train. That went right through to uh, Bangor. And uh, even when I went to work, uh, they had the best of cars on there, and that had a parlor car mm -hmm. on there. And then the next thing was train number 123, which was a conventional train that left at 115, and the rear end of that train was dropped at Dover and made a train up to Conway, not Conway, went up to Conway Branch. And then the next thing was number 19, which was went over the eastern route. Mm -hmm. That was the... Five minutes of five, four thirty, something like that, and that went out over the eastern route. And then the next thing was number twenty-one. That was a local to Portland. And then the next thing was uh, twenty-three, which was the Gulf to the Maritimes. That was the sleeping car train. And then the only other one was two sixty-three. I think the number was. And at that time, when they got it, the flying, flying Yankee, the tin can, and that again was another eastern route train. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, they only stopped at Salem on demand, and then they stopped at Newburyport and Portsmouth. And at Salem, it was a flag stop. And in my memory of working, it's the only train that I knew of that stopped at Salem. And on one of the posts on the platform near the uh, Margin Street crossing, uh, they still had one of the old green and white boards that they put up perpendicular. If they had people for the train. Like a because, stop, yeah, so this is uh, night. And <clears throat> even that late in the time with that modern train, that's what they used if they had passes with a green and white 
kerosene lamp not really good. So that was the last that I knew, and that was that was the number of trains going to uh, Portland when I when I hired out. Did you work on that on the tin fish? No, I never worked on it. I, I did head on it. I, I don't know how many times that I get called to to work a train out of Portland in the morning and then living in Salem, I would go down to Salem Depot and deadhead on that, you know, mm -hmm. to Portland and then mm -hmm. sleep on a table in, up in Portland Union Station to to cover my job the next morning. Mm -hmm. Oh, we had the we had the best of sleeping accommodations. I, I used to uh, when I used to catch uh, eighty one and eighty two out of Worcester, which was the state of Maine that came in came from New York. And there again, they were through train, about always late, and we used to deadhead out on the midnight uh, train out of uh, South Station. Mm -hmm. They gave us a temporary pass, and we went over and deadheaded out. And then we get out to Worcester, and they'd be an hour or two hours late, and all we had to sleep on was a great big wooden table that the conductors did their work on, so we'd try to crawl on the wooden table. And then and in the summertime, you'd also have uh, the east wind, mm -hmm. which was one of the earliest... Uh, uh, what type of train? A special train that had a had a yellow stripe painted all down the side. It was the first marked train, I think, in the country that was you know that was something special and it had this stripe that went down through the through the middle of it. And I never I never did work that. And that went on through to uh, Bangor, mm -hmm. but the state of Maine, eighty one and eighty two, that terminated it at Portland mm -hmm. know, and stayed there. They didn't have railroad wise that you could lay over, and I know they had a few at one of the cities, Deerfield, and a few others. They did there, but nowhere, nowhere on the Portland Division. Mm -hmm. No, I mean in Marblehead, you just had a so-called little bunk room and a little boiler house down there, which no one would use. And Lynn Station, you had a room up there that nobody would use, and that's why we always slept in the cars. I see. The old wooden cars, because uh, the backs of the seats turned over. So what we would do, we'd take three cushions out of three seats and take two of the seats and put them crosswise and then put the cushions on the top of them and put one crosswise, and that was our bed. bed. Yeah, pretty comfortable, too. Uh -huh. But some of the old conductors used to get upset if they came to work in the morning and be some young rookie and you'd be sleeping there, and then they'd get mad at you because when you took your bed down, sometimes on the back of the seat there might be a little indentation from where the seat cushion, you know, mm -hmm. because... And that would bother them. Yeah, it would bother them. Of course, they'd been in their home in their sure. own bed all night. Yeah. Uh, Haverhill had a uh, bunk room. Lawrence did at uh, Portsmouth. They had a a bunk room over the baggage room, but you couldn't possibly sleep there because it was right over the baggage room. And any train that left there, that was exactly where the steam engine sat, right next to where you mm -hmm. were sleeping on the second floor. So mm -hmm. you couldn't couldn't uh, you know sleep <clears> there. They had a fairly good bunk room down to uh, Portland. Had about. 15 or 20 bunks in it, I mm -hmm. guess, you know, like that. And uh, you could at least stretch out on them. No no linens or anything, but, I mean, it had a pillow, case, a pillow and a mattress that you could at least stretch out on, you mm -hmm. know, and get 20 winks. Mm -hmm. But uh, not not on the Portland Division. They didn't happen to have any Ys. Uh, down to Rockport, they had an old place down there, and when they tore the station down, one of the houses near there, they paid a, a woman a certain amount, and she saved a, a room for train crews. But I don't think any... Train crew ever used one. The only ones I knew that were used once in a while. You get a spare engineer that would take advantage of the free room for the night. Mm -hmm. But that covered the law. I mean, it was it was shady at best, but I mean, it, it did cover the law so that we couldn't say, well, you know, they didn't provide us a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we hear that as uh, commuter service was uh, increasingly being made uh, tougher to run because of the, the parallel highways, that mm -hmm. it was deliberately downgraded. People were right. discouraged. From riding the trains, uh, especially mm -hmm. of course, you know, the McGinnis era. Right. Um, do you remember actually seeing any any of that being deliberately done? Mm -hmm. Well, about the worst instance I can remember, all during those years, I was president of a Brotherhood Lodge, local six twenty one. So whenever there are any cutback hearings, I of course attended the hearings, and I usually had a a run where I would have time off in Boston, or I would swap off with somebody. And the Swampscott branch from Swampscott to Marblehead was the most notable, noticeable instance. They went in and they asked to take off a couple of the middle of the day trains and those four round trips at night that I had spoken of previously and to leave the two morning trains, 2204 and 2206, and then the peak trains in the night, 2219 and 221 on, and they were both six car trains, well patronized. Well... You'd go to the hearings and you'd sit there and they'd tell how much it cost. I remember very well there. They charged, tried to put in a charge for toilet paper, for drinking cups, 
for water, for ice, which on local service wasn't provided. Toilet paper, yes. But there was a stipulation when I went to work, and I think it was 35 miles, that if a train didn't go over 35 miles, they didn't have to have drinking water. Mm -hmm. They all had toilets, but I mean, they didn't have to have drinking water. And so, of course, our union representative got right up and objected. And he said, but you don't have drinking water, you know, and ice on the Marblehead trains. Well, the way they got around that, that sometimes you wouldn't have your regular equipment, and they would put cars on that had come in off the road that had been serviced with ice and ice water. Mm -hmm. So that's how they got around that. And that was an example of what extremes they went to. So the town of Marblehead, oh, they protested profusely, and we came up with figures of how many people rode and all like that. But when they come out with a decision, it was complete abandonment. And all the railroad, oh, well, that isn't really what they expected. They expected they wouldn't take off the other trains, but it was all cut and dry. Sure. It was a, it was a kangaroo court. I mean, any of the hearings that I went into, some trains, well, when they took off the toss wheel trains or dams, you couldn't complain. I mean, sincerely, they weren't the, there wasn't the business. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I remember train 208 that they took off out of New Report. Now that was an eight car train, peak train. And yet the DPU gave them permission to do away with that mm -hmm. train. Mm -hmm. And they said that people would ride either an earlier train or a later train, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you would, uh, through the union there, we would get counts from our own conductors. And get the counts before and after. And you okay. and of course the equipment, naturally the best equipment was on the main lines and the some of the equipment that they bought, now they bought these cars one time, what they call Pennsylvania Reds. They were steel cars. And of course they were being pushed, I'll admit at the time, to get steel equipment mm -hmm. because of course they had wooden equipment. Right. And these cars were terrible. They were terrible to ride in. They had terrible springs on them. They had the vestibule trap doors that didn't work. The steam heating was an atrocious setup. In the middle of the car, underneath the center seats, you had two steam valves, and one was a bleeder valve, and the other was the steam heat. And to go over to North Street in the morning and hook your engine on, and it would take you an hour from the time that you got the steam from the engine through to the rear end, and then to get the steam into each one of those cars and get the bleeder valves and... The cars were coal bonds. You just, you just couldn't get them hot. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that was sort of a way that they were discouraging, discouraging riding. the riding. But I do have to admit, though, the one thing, they did not have the mechanical breakdown. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the few times that I can ever think that we broke down on a steam engine, that the times are so seldom that, you know, we'd ever have any problem with a steam engine that it was very, very rare. And yet, as the engineers took over diesels, I know we've asked a few of them that we've done interviews with, almost to a man, they all said they were happy to see the diesels come. That's right. They were happy to see the diesels come, but then you got into your modern-day electronics with blown fuses and overheated traction motors, and that's where the trouble began. Mm -hmm. I mean, once once we started having the, uh, the diesels, and by the way, I, when I was on the Portsmouth Local, we got the first electric motive uh, switcher, road switcher diesels. And uh, we had one on the uh, Portsmouth, and boy, they really ran that thing into the ground, and it was quite quite an engine, too. And we had a mechanic re riding with us all the time, and we would start out of that on the morning trip of the Portsmouth local and get into Portsmouth, and then that engine would make two round trips hauling pasture trains between Portsmouth and Boston, and then the night Portsmouth local out of there would have it back into Boston. Mm -hmm. So that one engine, they were getting a round trip freight and two round trips pasture. And they only bought, I think it was three of those engines, the 1550, the 1551, and the 1552. Those are the BL2s. Yeah, that's, that's all they mm -hmm. ever bought. And yet we really enjoyed it. Now, we would like an Ipswich. It had uh, what they called a switching mode that the engineer could throw it in so that we could kick cars. Uh, otherwise, you know, give them a good push and mm -hmm. let go of them. Mm -hmm. And you could, uh, <clears throat> it could either be in a road mode or in this switching mode, and I mean, as far as we were concerned, see, they were a great engine, but they only bought three of them, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. and I don't know what whatever went wrong with them. Mm -hmm. What about the Talgo train? We've touched on that briefly mm -hmm. tonight. I know a lot yeah. of people that rode on it hated it, couldn't stand yeah. it. Uh, mm -hmm. What was your experience with that? Well, I only worked it once or twice, but uh, it was it was a very uncomfortable train, and, and to walk between the units, there was a lot of motion in there, too. Mm -hmm. Even though it was enclosed, 
It reminded me of when you go down to the airport ramps there in, uh, at Logan Airport, when you go down those folding units mm -hmm. where they go up against the side of the plane. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like what it was walking between the <clears throat> Calgo units and going over switches or going through a curve. I mean, you, you lost your sense of, uh, uh, what's the word I want to, steadiness. You know? equilibrium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, equilibrium. Yeah. You, you really, and, and the seats weren't that comfortable in them and uh, had a lot of problems, had a lot of mechanical problems mm -hmm. with them, too. Plus, they were loud, and I know they sat yeah. at night at the end of the line, yeah. and a lot of people complained. That's right, yeah. And uh, they were like some of the, the diesel engines that we've had that you just couldn't idle them down mm -hmm. if you wanted uh, head-end power. I mean, I like some of the, uh, I don't know how they are now, but when we first got these, 1,100 engines, 1,000 class engines there. Uh, the newer ones now, they have the two idles on them, so if you're not using head-end power, you can at least idle the engine down, but right. if you're using the head-end power, like I know when I was on train 204 out of Ipswich when I retired in 83 and 84, usually we'd have a, like 1,100, but if we had a 1,100 engine on there, gee, on a cold morning, I mean, we'd have to stay up in the yard almost to leaving time away from the houses so we can run the engine at high speed to mm -hmm. have the head-end power on. Mm -hmm. But I think these newer engines now, that head-end is a separate unit, so they're right. not running into that. Right, know. that's correct. I'm going to throw this out to the uh, the audience we have here tonight. Uh, you gentlemen, I'm sure, probably have a few questions you might like to throw in before we wrap this up. Why don't you just jump in? Major, what's the, the, the funniest incident, the most humorous incident that you've ever had, that you've ever experienced, that you can relate without getting anyone... <laughs> Well, I think I've touched on them. I think the one about Morris Whalen losing his pipe and the one about the passenger, and I, I really can't think of any, anything else. I can think of a lot of escape, narrow escapes and like that, but... Uh, well, one of those yeah. well, okay, we were coming up uh, during the coal strike, the Portsmouth Local, we ran in the daytime, and we had a bobtail diesel. That was an A unit. We had the 4260. And that was the only engine we could use because the configuration of the bell on the roof was the only one that would go through Salem Tunnel. Mm -hmm. And we had that, and we'd leave Boston at 12.30, and we'd get back into Boston about 9 o'clock at night. So this one night we were coming along, and uh, Linden Tower was still in operation. So they uh, told us when we left Salem, and we had picked up uh, cars there. They said, well, there's cars in Lynn, and I'm going to run you in on the, the middle at Lynn. So now in order to get on the middle at Lynn, we had to go from the westbound, right in front of the old hood plant, onto the eastbound for a distance of hundreds of yards on against the traffic onto the eastbound iron, and then to go in on the middle. So we were doing that this night, and we see 259 coming along. Now that was a P2, it was a steam engine, and it was dark. This was 8.30 at night. And Carol Smith from... New report, Hartag Smith was a brakeman, and I was the flagman, and uh, Chester Whitehead was the conductor. He was back in the caboose. I can't remember who our engine crew was. As I say, we're in this 4260, which has a high cab. So we're watching, and after he come off the drawbridge, we're watching and we're seeing the smoke going. That means that he's working power. So then we begin to get a little concern, and he's getting closer, and he's still working power. So about that time, we figure, <clears> hey, he's going to go right through the middle of us. So the engineer just jumped off and feet flew off the dead man and put the train in an emergency. And two of us bailed off on one side of the engine to the other, and he stopped just short of going right through the middle of our train. So I won't use the, the name of the engineer. In fact, he's still alive today. So I went up to him, and I had my electric lamp, you know, and shined it up, and he says, What are you guys doing there, Major? I said, what do you mean what we're doing? We're, we're going into the middle. We had a bottom yellow on the home signal. Now we've got a yellow jack. We're going on the middle. I said, what are you doing? You've got a red signal. And he says, well, he says, you know, half the time when you go on the Saugus River Draw, you'd have a high yellow. But by the time you got to this next home signal, Lin Tao would wake up and he'd give you a clear signal. And he says, he didn't give me the clear signal. And he says, I just took it for granted. And he says, I was almost on top of it when I see the shine from the freight cars. And he just stopped in time. And that's the closest that I ever come to one on the B&M. Mm. What about uh, the Swamps Get Wreck? Everybody seems to know somebody that was involved. Well, in that. the Swamps Get Wreck, I was on the, the damnless job ahead of that. And that was a very serious incident in my life because uh, I was working with a brakeman. Harold Holman was on the train with me. 
And uh, on the train that was in the wreck, Cliff Holman. Uh, there's a coincidence there. No relation? Both, no. Both trains came from Danvers. So I, I didn't know anything about it. We had gone into Boston and gone out to Haverhill. So coming back at Andover when we stopped, the agent told us at Andover, he said, there's just been a terrible wreck at Swanscott. So we got down into Reading, and Chet Merrill, the agent there, told us more about it and like that. So I didn't think too much of it. We got into Boston, and I was all done at that time, the way my job worked. We took a Bud car out of Salem, Bud train out of Salem Engine House, and went to Danvers, and then we used to take that train into Boston, out to Havel and back, and then we were done. So, because we got to Lynn, they took us off the train at Lynn, and they bust the people. We didn't even go near the wreck, because they took us down around the beach road. You know, you couldn't go anywhere near the wreck. And I got in my car in Salem and drove home to Danvers here. We lived down the other side of town. There's a lot of cars at the house. I didn't think of them. And there's people there, and the minister and everything. They thought I had been killed in the wreck, mm -hmm. because I was fat. Cliff Holman, the <clears> other <throat> conductor, he was fat. And, mm -hmm. I mean, everything everything fit right in place, really, you know. And my brother-in-law ran a gas station, and he'd gone down to find out. And there was a yard brakeman wanting to get over to the wreck, so he took him over. So he was able to get right up to the area. And, well, yes, they didn't know who it was, but, oh, yes, in my description. And, yes, there was a Holman on the job. So, anyway, when I came home, I, everyone was so relieved to see me. So I learned a lesson there, and I always told any rookie that I ever broke in after that, that always let your family know what train you're on, mm -hmm. the time it leaves and where it goes, and the train number, so that if there's any wreck any time, people won't be needlessly worried. Because it's amazing how fast news will spread. Now, Henry Parsons' sister lived out in Los Angeles, and she had heard it out in Los Angeles, and she called Danvers here to find out if Henry was involved. Now, this shows you how news can travel. Mm -hmm. So that was something to me. After that, I always kept right out by the telephone. If I was train 2401 and that was a four-car train and who the normal crew members were so that if anything ever happened, there'd never be that concern again. Did you know Ernest Twiddle at the engineer on that? Oh, yes, very well, yeah. He was yeah. Uh, quite a senior man at that time. Yeah, I worked with him the Saturday before that. And I'll tell you an incident that happened. I'll tell you as it happened with no comments. But we were going to uh, Haverhill on train 113, the 1015 out, and it was slippery. There was snow on the ground, and he ran by the station at Balladvale, by it quite a bit. So we had a lot of cars that day because there was something going on in the Boston Garden. So anyway, I got off the rear end. I was the flagman, and Dayton Gee was uh, deadheading out assistant conductor. So I went back to flag us to back up because when we had come by Lowell Junction, I noticed there was a freight waiting right there to come out and behind us. So snow on the ground, and I was walking back, and I could see the 2914 from North Conway coming on the inbound track, so I made sure I was walking between my track, and all of a sudden I heard this yell, and it was Dayton Gee riding, riding the rear end, and Turtlelot was backing right up on top of me, and if it hadn't been for Dayton Gee hollering to me, I'd have been killed. So you think there's a possibility that Twiddle Lot wasn't quite up to snuff? You said it, I did. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are good engineers and there are reckless engineers. Mm -hmm. There are engineers that can make the time and do it safely. There are guys that can't make the time even if they don't do it safely. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone, there were some engineers that some of the fellows I work with were such great fellows. I mean, oh, I mean, name a few... Carl Kennison over in Marblehead. Now, he was one of the best engineers I ever worked with. He and I, oh, when we had the Bud cars there, we used to go out mornings there, and I had Bill Robinson from Rockport, a brakeman. And this is when we were just at Bud cars, no diesel. Mm -hmm. And they were breaking down, and they'd call me, and they'd say, Major, you get down to Rockport, there's a cripple over in the Derrick track. Will you pick it up and bring it back? So we'd go down, and we had this thing worked out to a T, and Robbie would jump off, and he'd be getting the car ready, and we'd... And we'd make that pick up, and we only had about 18 minutes, and we'd get out of there right on time. And they, uh, I'll tell you, who was Don Rogers was the uh, the uh, dispatcher at the time. Uh, um, Don Hills, Don Hill was the dispatcher, and he used to get the biggest kick out of it because no matter what he told us to do, we'd go down to Rockport and we'd do it, and we'd get out of there on time, and we'd be on the Boston on time. Mm -hmm. And they used to get the biggest kick out of it. And yet some other crew would go down there, and they'd have the same move, and they'd. They'd lose a half an hour doing it. Amazing. Yet we weren't unsafe. Right. Yeah. But yes. we just we just knew what we were doing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like that. Like and a team. Yeah, it was it was a team effort. Yeah. 
The freight trains were the same way. I mean, when I worked on the Portsmouth Local, there was a flagman on there by the name of Danny Harrington, a little tiny fella. He was one of the best railroad fellows I ever worked with. Oh, he was so smart, and he was fast and all like that, but oh, he was such a great, it was a joy to, mm -hmm. to work with him, mm -hmm. really, you know. Now, when I worked one job up here and up to Danvers here, and I used to have to get the engine out of the engine house and hooking on the coal cars, and Bill Campbell was the engineer that lived here in Danvers, and I can't remember who the firemen were. And they were so utterly mean to a trainman that it was scandalous to... I would get in there and try to hook up those steam hoses, never offer to give you any help. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if I didn't have a hammer, I'd hop, knock on the cab. They would make me climb up onto the tender, open up the curtain, get the hammer, close the curtain, climb down. And I mean, just so completely uncooperative mm -hmm. that it was, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but that's the way some of them were. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a, another engine crew out of Reading. And when the first job I ever bit off out of Salem, and my middle trip was to Rockport, and my father had owned the job. So he took me off. He says, now, when you're backing this guy in from yard two, the first time you use the air, if you don't stop, you put the brakes in emergency. Because this guy, when I try the brakes out in the yard, instead of restoring the braking controls to me, he wouldn't. So if I went to stop, as much as I would release the air pressure to put the brakes on, because the pump would pump it right off. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, if I wasn't careful, he would push me by a red signal. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew how to... Uh, handle that and every guy you work with they had their little, little quirks some things. of the engineers yeah. i mean that's the the way the word hoghead comes from i mean it's and the same way with some of the the conductors everyone you had a, a, a value of and you'd mm -hmm. say oh, okay go out to uh reading tomorrow morning and cover train 118 you'd say well who's the conductor on there bill scott oh geez bill scott he hates new men he'll do a job on me you know or you'd, you'd get on you'd go somewhere else and Get down to Ports and you'd say, who's the uh, conductor? And you'd say, uh, uh, well, I can't think of his name now. Several of the nice ones down there. And, and uh, oh, boy, it'd be such a pleasure to work with him, you know, mm -hmm. and like that. So it was quite a, quite a difference. How was Henry Bowen to work with? Uh, Henry Bowen was never a conductor in, in my time. He always was a, an assistant conductor. Mm -hmm. So that's the only dealings that I, mm -hmm. he, I don't know if I ever... Oh, I probably worked a couple of times on a train with him where I might have been the brakeman or the flagman. But uh, as I say, he usually, for the most of when I knew him, he had like an assistant conductor's job that started and ended in Beverly. Mm -hmm. So I know he used to take a lot of pictures of, of crews. That's right, yeah. And mm -hmm. had them in the magazine. And there was yeah. also something about uh, Christmas trees and the coaches and things like that that yeah. he was involved with. Yeah. I wonder if he was yeah. a little bit unusual. Yeah, well, he, <clears throat> he was quite an avid fan. And, of course, you know, after he retired, he ran... Uh, uh, Elderly trips to yes. places, you know, yeah. he would do that. Just a, a side story talking about that. On train 1311 that came out here to Danvers over the Tossfield line here from Wakefield Junction, every Christmas Eve they had a Christmas party on there. And Harold Levitt, when I was on, Harold Levitt was a conductor, and I forget who the other brakeman was. And they used to have the front car, and they decorated it up, and they had booze and... <laughs> And it started in Boston, and the last of the ones got off at West Peabody. That's where the party would end. And they had all popcorn and cheese and crap. Oh, they had the bit and aprons and all and all like that. Well, one year I was on there, and I was the flagman, so I really didn't see anything of it until down the line, and, and they had saved some stuff for me. Well, then the next year I happened to be the head brakeman, but there were so many crosses to flag on there that once you got to Wakefield, Wakefield, you know, Wakefield Center, you just rode up in the engine because every time you turn around, you had to get out the front end to flag a crossing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't get in on the party, but when I come back, gee, they knew they found out I was a teetotaler, so they'd save tonic for me. And uh, I can probably remember all the stuff that I, I brought home with mm -hmm. me, you know, and that, what a party they had every year. Now, there was one fellow on that crew, I won't mention names. He was a heck of a guy, but he was a person, if he had one drink, he was gone. He couldn't stop. So I would come out on that job nights, and if we stopped, this is when the Waters River Bridge was out one time. So instead of going to Danvers, we only came to West Peabody and then came down over the Lowell Branch into Peabody in that way. So we had to wait there until our scheduled leaving time. So if I saw this fellow go over in the, the bar room to get a drink, when I got home that night, 
I'd say to my wife, well, I'll lay out my conductor's uniform tomorrow and get my punch ready and everything else because he's not going to be working tomorrow. Three o'clock in the morning, the phone will be, Major, yeah, so-and-so's got a toothache. He's got to go to the dentist tomorrow. And I said, yeah, I know, and he can't make it. And it used to be the most laughable thing to my wife and I. It was sad, yeah. but I mean, he was... So that second year, someone got after the ones in the party, and they said to make sure that he didn't have a drink. And they gave a couple of bottles to the other break. So then we were put up at North Street that night. The brakeman gave them to the conductor. But, I mean, it was sad, though. You know. Did you ever work the uh, Saugus Brand? Oh, sure. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about the passenger services that, that they used to run, you know, right up until the end of the late Yeah, well, the, uh, the Saugus Branch, there were two trains that uh, put up in Lynn, down at what we call East, in the East Lynn, opposite the engine house. Then there was one train that put up on track four in the station next to the item building. So that train in the morning uh, went over to Marblehead. Then they came back to Lynn, and they dropped the passengers. And then they went in over the Saugus, unless they had Saugus Branch, and they went in over the Saugus Branch. And then at night, uh, you had two trains come out over the Saugus Branch that put up in Lynn, and then the third one came out main line to Lynn. Now, that's only a short distance, but that was a busy train because they picked up all the people... Uh, from uh, East Somerville, East Everett, Everett, Chelsea, Forbes, Revere. That was a busy train. And brought them all into Lynn. And then they changed at Lynn and got on to your easterly uh, Portsmouth or uh, Rockport trains. So the Saugus Branch, those were four-car trains. And, and we used to run about, well, when I first went, about 300 passions. But they were an extremely hard branch for a new young person to take tickets on. Because, of course, you can almost see one station from the next one, and to learn the fares, they weren't zones like now, and I mean almost every, one station would be 10 cents, the next one would be 12 cents, the next station would be 14 cents, or the round trip would be so much. Or they wouldn't be going to Boston, they'd get on at Lynn Common, and they'd be going to East Saugus. Or they'd get on at East Saugus, and they'd be going to Cliftondale. And I mean, oh, I used to hate to have to take tickets on that branch. Yeah, all. Oh. I think there were 26 crossing tenders on that branch. Yeah. And one sad incident we had one night on a, I think it was a Christmas Eve. I was on the second Saugus branch. And I think it was the first year we were married. So the first train came down to the crossing there at Lynn Common, the next street. I can't think of the name now. And the crossing tender hadn't shown up. And the first train hit a car there and killed one person and seriously injured the second one. Well, we were tied up. I was, we were right at Western Avenue there where the tracks still go across there. And I called my wife and, oh, I don't know, I was something like three or four hours late. And that was, I think that was our, as I remember, one of our first Christmas Eve on, on being married. We came down another night off the Saugus Branch. Kids had a rock in the track. And when we went across the crossovers, we uh, went off the iron. And we were there at about one o'clock in the morning until they put us back on the iron. Yeah, I think they're going to run out of power yeah, here yeah. on the batteries. Uh, Major, I'd like to thank you on behalf okay. of the Boston Maine okay. Historical Society. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening, and as always, if you're interested in learning more about our organization, you can head right on over to our website, www.bmrrhs.org.